All right. I have a feeling we're going to be spending quite a bit of time talking about this over the next few weeks. But hockey fans, um, you know, of all ages, remember the 72 Summit Series. And believe it or not, the 50th anniversary is coming up. And uh, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Summit Series, uh, there is an incredible new four-part documentary debuting with part one on the CBC on September 14th. And um, there is a lot to get to on this. So uh, let's get right to it and welcome in uh, the co-director and co-writer of the Summit 72 documentary, Dave Bedini on the show. Dave, thanks so much for doing this. It's a, a real pleasure to have you on the program. Hey, Andrew. Yeah, totally my pleasure. Um, you are such an interesting dude. I mean, uh, you know, you've been involved in the music, writing, um, but you're also a huge hockey fan. I mean, maybe if you could, before we talk about the actual product, tell us about um, getting involved in this, um, what brought it to life, and um, why it was so important to be uh, to tell this story uh, with everything available to you now in 2022. I've always kind of, you know, like in a bunch of my books, my second book was called Tropic of Hockey, where I went around the world and played hockey, and, and we, um, we made a documentary called The Hockey Nomad about it for CBC. And, and even when I was, you know, writing that book, I, I kind of, I found, I found reason to talk about 72. Um, I remember being on a bus in the desert in um, the United Arab Emirates, um, uh, coming back from this tournament, like just a rec, a rec league tournament. But there were some pretty high level players and there was a bunch of kids from Switzerland who were um, in this tournament and they were Italians, young Italians. So we were talking and um, I started telling them about Esposito and Phil and, and about 72. And I kind of wrote about that moment telling these kids about you know, being a young Italian kid myself and seeing this guy on television, you know, after game four and how he kind of called out all of Canada because the team Canada was booed in Vancouver and the whole nation was turning against the team. I just talked about like how important it was to see him, you know, this, this Italian Canadian on the CBC because in the seventies, there weren't Italian Canadians on the CBC. It was all white, white people. So I sort of communicated that to them. I wrote about that in Tropic Hockey. So, I've been kind of talking about 72 for a long time. And, you know, when this opportunity came up, Nick DePontier, the showrunner, um, you know, we were friends. He shot the Hockey Nomad, the first one. And he was like, oh, Dryden's called me. You know, he wants to do this official documentary. You know, I would have been crazy to not get in there and, you know, get my hands dirty and be involved in this project. And as a bonus, there was about 60 hours of unseen archival footage um from the series so you know when that kind of stuff is you know presented to you there's the opportunity you know to tell it in a way that's really alive and vibrant and and different in terms of what we know about that series so totally jumped at the opportunity well you mentioned that archival footage i mean i believe was like a hundred reels from the hockey hall of fame discovered and uh remastered uh, with all the incredible technology we have right now i mean uh was that like finding a, yeah. a, a pot of gold in a, in a back room for an event, for an, a, a project like this? Yeah, we kind of knew that there was that. So Eagleson, um, the, um, well, some people call him disgraced. I suppose he is to a point, but he continues to be a relatively, relatively vibrant guy in his 80s. He, um, he uh, you know, uh, hinted that there was this stuff out there. Um, uh, he commissioned... A, docu- a documentary for that series for those 28 days in September in 72, but it never saw the light of day. They ran out of money or whatever. They couldn't find a broadcaster. I'm not sure. I actually think everybody was so burnt out after that event that um, <clears throat> they never got around to doing it. So, yeah, and if you've ever been to the archives um, or the warehouse, really, at the Hall of Fame, it's insane. Like, there's so much stuff. So it wasn't surprising that there was this stack of reels, you know, under a bunch of boxes in the corner, which was the case. So we knew that we knew that this this footage was out there. We didn't know to what extent it was out there. And, you know, another thing that happened once we sort of announced our intentions to do this film was, you know, a lot of home movies found us. You know, people were sending in their, you know, their Super 8 footage uh, that they'd taken you know, whether it was uh, domestically here in Canada or abroad, 3,000 Canadians went 
to um, to Russia uh, for games um, five to eight uh, in seventy two. So a lot of people shot film, a lot of still photographs too. So that was super exciting. Like you mentioned about technology, you know, we had the opportunity to really clean that stuff up. Not not to um, um, uh, make it, you know. Um, not to scrub it too clean because it really looks like we wanted to maintain that aesthetic of kind of home movie uh, stuff. But um, yeah, we, we, we were able to just brighten the colors and bump it up a little bit. Um, but the, but the 16 millimeter um, footage that was shot by Al Stewart uh, for this documentary is beautiful anyways. And it's frankly 72, like there are mm-hmm. colors that exist of that time that kind of aren't really, you know, part of our, you know, our, our, our color scape, in, in 2022 and stuff. So, um, yeah, that was delicious. The speakers, all that stuff to use that kind of as the spine of, for the series. Uh, uh, Dave, as part of the, uh, uh, of the documentary, uh, which begins on the 14th uh, with episode number one, you were able to interview, I mean, a number of legends on the Canadian side, but also the Russian side. And I'm interested, I mean, this is still 50 years ago, I and mean, what stood out to you about the memories even recently, all these years later, from both sides, and how different was the Canadian perspective to the Russian? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there in that answer. I mean, the Russian, it's funny, and Dryden talks about this too, it's one of those rare instances, in a way, that, you know, where kind of both sides did win. I mean, the Russians were their style of play and their approach to the game was validated, you know, by the nature of the series, it being so close. I mean, you know, they were, they were supremely intimidated by, you know, the legend of the NHL players and, and how great they were. And they really, they really didn't think their system was going to stand up against just the, the, the sheer, like, talent of the NHL players. And of course they win seven, three in Montreal and the series goes down to the last 34 seconds. So the Russians felt great about their program coming out of that series. And the Canadians were vindicated because they won. Right. So, so it was kind of one of those perfect situations. Um, and also you got to remember in 72, I mean, I was nine, <clears throat> but, but knowing what I know about seventies and cold war, we just didn't, we, there was no window uh, popularly, there was no window into the Soviet Union. It was it was a closed society, right? In a lot of ways. So, you know, and whatever images you know found found uh, their way onto our television were you know, largely, you know, pro- from the propaganda machine. So, having you know, being able to see people in the stands <clears throat> in Luzhniki Arena, um, really, you know, it was a gift to us. We were able to see this this empire on the other side of the world. And conversely, you know, I met Russians who said like, you know, seeing French Canadians, uh, Anglophiles in the Montreal forum, you know, in August, 1972 blew their minds, honestly, you know, um, the way people dressed, you know, um, distinguished men and women, you know, like just groovy chicks in the crowd and cool dudes. Like it, it was the whole world opened up for them. So, that's really kind of beautiful as well in terms of the cultural exchange like that, that just existed naturally because we were able to see them. They were able to see us and not merely in a sporting way, but in a cultural way too. Dave, I mean, when we talk about the, the summit series, I mean, it certainly is a hockey story. It's one of the most famous hockey series of all time. So, I mean, there is the sporting event too, but um, as you kind of alluded to, so much of it was about what was not happening on the ice. Two different cultures, two different societies. Uh, for, as far as the documentary goes, how would you compare the hockey content to what this what this series meant to people in two very different societies 50 years ago? Well, that's the neat thing about 72, I think. And that, that was the thing that made it really interesting to us as filmmakers in that, you know, the cultural nature of the event matched the sporting nature of the event. That's pretty rare, I think, in in sports where, you know, the cultural context, there's as much depth to it as it is the sporting context. You know, like the Russians after uh, Montreal uh, arrived in Toronto, and because they won, they were given um, uh, an opportunity. So they were given a, a pass, basically, and they were escorted. They were escorted down Young Street 
the Sam the Record Man, where they were given an allowance and able to buy albums, which they could only buy on the black market in, in Russia. So that was, you know, incredible for them. Uh, and conversely, you know, the, the Canadians, when they got to, to Russia, it was kind of the opposite. You know, they had stakes to here, all their beer disappears. Dryden tells a story about, you know, all of their coke vanished. It was all taken and sold on, sold, uh, sold on the black market. And they were, they, I think before game seven, they were really excited to hear that they were going to get, you know, they were going to get soda pop. They were going to get, they were going to get, you know, something to drink. They thought it was going to be coke. And then Dryden says a skid of Jolly Cola, which was like um, a soft drink from Denmark like appeared in the dressing rooms and stuff. So all of that, all of that behind the scenes stuff is really intriguing to the cultural context. And um, that was really fun to kind of tell this, that story and hear the players talk about those experiences as well. Uh, Dave Bedini is the uh, co-writer and co-director of Summit 72, a four-part series commemorating the 50th anniversary of the 72 Summit Series. Episode 1, Hockey Nation's debuts on the CBC on September 14th. Dave, I'm sure, I mean, obviously, you know, we've just sort of talked about how famous this series has been, uh, its imprint on Canadian history. Um, When doing this, all this work for this project, was there... Was there something that you learned that you didn't know before that really stuck with you or surprised you? One of the things that um, Harry Sinden told us, coach of the Canadian team, I should say too, Harry just turned 90 and his memory is was just so acute uh, of something that happened 50 years ago, um, which was a great gift to us, you know, having someone who was there vividly portray all the stuff that happened, but told us that, you know, Canada was down 5-3 going into the third period of Game 8. And one of the things that he did tactically was he had his team, he had the guys um, play the third, the, begin, the first 10 minutes of the, three, of the third period as if they were um, ahead 5-3 rather than behind 5-3. So he had them protect that deficit, if that makes sense. And his, his idea was keep it at 5-3, score in the first half of the last, 10 minutes and then and then again to tie it in the last half of the five minutes well you know history tells us that some russian official came to the canadians at the beginning of the third period and said if the game is tied uh we'll have scored one more goal and we will claim victory so harry was like oh my idea went completely out the window after that but they did they did play kind of a prevent defense in the beginning they got a goal to make a 5-3 so it was a bonus but I thought that was really interesting tactically. As opposed to coming out immediately and getting a quick goal, he wanted them to protect that deficit. So there was just need to be taken through all of that. And that was something I didn't know um, um, walking into this series. That was new information to me. Dave, of course, uh, the first four games were in Canada, then it went uh, overseas to uh, to Russia. Game number three was in Winnipeg. In the, in the piece promoting the, the documentary, it's referred to as a wobbly tie. Um what do we know about the game in Winnipeg and where it fit into uh, the overall eight-game opus? Yeah, Winnipeg was pivotal. Um, the Russians scored two shorthanded goals, which was quite illuminating, really. When you think of the power, how you know the the power, you know the Canadian power play was, you know, had some of the greatest players of its of its era on the ice. Um, but that was, you know, that was um, troubling, I think, to the Canadian team. Um, because because of that, also they you know it was a comeback tie for the Russians as well. And traditionally, you know, the Canadians had won in Toronto, and they expected that momentum to move on, which it did for the first half of the game. And then the Russians were able to meet the Canadians, um, uh, uh, you know, even on the scoreboard by coming back and by getting these shorthanded goals. I think the Canadian brass knew they were in deeper than they were because of that comeback. Also, the Russians played a bunch of kids. In that um, uh, in that game as well, which um, again they were un, they you know the, we'd we'd got to know Yakushev, we'd got to know Harlamov, we'd got to know Tretiak, uh, but you know these bench players uh, came out and um, and dominated the game uh, as well. So seeing that the Russians had this kind of incredible depth was also terrifying to the Canadians. And then um, moving into Vancouver, it's no contest again. So two games basically are blowouts uh, in the Russians' favor in Canada. And you can imagine going to Russia um, after that 
you know, people, uh, people forget how, you know, how down uh, the whole hockey community, the whole Canadian hockey community was on Team Canada going to Russia. I mean, it just seemed purely impossible that they would, they would come back, you know, playing on a, an ice surface that was nearly twice the size of the one that they were used to, going behind the Iron Curtain. You know, uh, Espo talks about phone calls in the middle of the night. One of the fans that we talked to mentions, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, the Russian national anthem would be playing in her room out of a speaker that was built into the wall. So they were spied upon. So, you know, um, uh, it, it seems so unlikely that they would come back to win. Of course, they lose the first game in Russia. They have to win the next three in order to win the series. And they do one of the greatest comebacks of all time. And considering the conditions, one of the most preposterous comebacks of all time. But, um, you know, I think Winnipeg, People felt good going into into the game, not only because of um, you know the momentum after Toronto, but also Winnipeg had been the home. It had been the crossroads for international hockey throughout the 60s and and uh, and early 70s. You know, it was base camp for Hockey Canada, and a lot of the Russian players and Russian teams had come through there to play um, uh, Team Canada, Father Bauer's team. Um, but that was all. In hindsight, that was an advantage for the Russians because. They'd been there before, right? They had they hadn't really been to Toronto or Montreal, but Winnipeg was known to them a little bit. So they were, you know, they felt a little bit more at ease. But coming out of that game and kind of coughing up that lead and and, and having the shorthanded goal scored against us was was the alarm bells that started to ring and people started to get that sinking feeling. Dave, really looking forward to episode one, which is titled Hockey Nations. Um, just, I guess, before we ask you specifically what we should look forward to in episode one, um, how did you figure out or decide what to put into each episode? I mean, uh, how is it separated, if you will? It's one of the kind of the awful things about about making art and really television because you're hamstrung a little bit by length, um, especially at, you know, because it's a broadcast um, uh, entity that has to, you know, dance around commercials and fit into that time slot. It's not as if it was just, if we didn't make it for streaming where, you know, um, it can, episodes can be as long as they have to be. So yeah, that was real, honestly, that, that was the toughest thing having to decide what to leave out. Right. Because there's so much story and there's 34 Canadian players and I think 26 Russian players, so many stories, so many, so many characters, really, and so many behind-the-scenes characters, also. So, and so much narrative. Um, so we had to be slightly vicious, I think, uh, when it came to deciding what was truly essential. But the series could be twice the length that it is because there's there's so much in there. No doubt about it. Uh, well, for those of us that are looking forward to setting our PVRs for the 14th. Um, Tee up a uh, hockey nations episode one with us uh, for us, if you would, Dave. Yeah. You know, we wanted to um, establish early on that this was going to be a film uh, about, uh, about an event that you hadn't seen before, you know, um, a film that was able to exist as a piece of, you know, uh, cinema television um, uh, it, that existed in 2022. Too, you know, because it's um, a largely a, about an event that has happened. There's always that fear that it can live in, 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 in you know, as a nostalgic work, um, and uh, and we didn't want it to be that. So we wanted it to have pace. You know, we wanted it to be you know cut in a way that was you know that really kind of moved, um, as opposed to. You know, uh, talking head highlight, talking head highlight, talking head highlight. We really wanted to, it to have its own its own kind of rhythm, I suppose. So, and also, music. I was the music director, so you know, I programmed the kind of stuff that you might not normally hear in a uh, in a work in which the subject is hockey. There's one there's one sequence I'm really proud of where um, the third period the Russians scored. I think it's three unanswered goals. Um, to win seven three, and I wanted to sort of show, reflect, kind of the the poetry, I suppose, of of the Russians. Remember in seventy two, you know, um, the way they skated. We take it for granted now, but players circling back with the puck that never happened, right? And 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 behind the back passes, and 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 um, uh, moving in almost like a um, 
east, west versus north and south, right? Moving in kind of a circular way. Um, I wanted to sort of, I wanted to portray that. So we found a Leonard Cohen song. Um, the game takes place in Montreal. So Leonard Cohen was the voice of Montreal in the 1970s, really. So it's beautiful. We lay this, we lay a song called The Traitor, this Leonard Cohen song over um, uh, shots of, you know, um, of the Russian players moving down the ice um, and skating beautifully. I mean, they made the Canadian players look like the dinosaurs that they were. Um, I mean, that dinosaur would adapt over the course of the eight game series, but in the beginning they were slow. They were rugged. They were hairy. They were like, they were, you know, um, uh, they were louts on ice in a lot of ways. They just couldn't keep up to the Russians. So we wanted to reflect that in, in a, a really kind of um, an evocative way. And so that's something to look for in episode one, but I think people really like it. And, um, and the series, uh, the way we tell the story is it, the series really kind of moves, I guess, over the course of those four episodes. Everyone's a little bit different, and I really hope people enjoy it. Well, I, I'll tell you what. I mean, uh, I cannot wait for this. It is such a, a famous series, um, and it's a famous cultural event. And regardless of how old you are, I think uh, you really will enjoy it. The first episode is September 14th with a new episode each week up until October 5th on the CBC. It is Summit 72. Dave Bedini, thank you so much. All the best with the project, and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. And um, as I said, we'll be watching and uh, we'll be talking about it here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Appreciate your time. Hey, my pleasure. Great talking to you.